Well, good morning, Ridgecrest. Let's stand to our feet. Every praise belongs to our Lord. Amen. being all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength to give to him in worship. Amen? Amen? Let's continue that as we pray together just for a moment. Father, it is in that. God, we thank you for that call to worship you. Every praise, Lord, is yours. And I pray that we give it to you with every fiber of our being now. Lord, let us concentrate and work hard to eliminate all the distractions in our world and culture, but God give you everything this moment as we worship together as family and as guests, and may we do it, God, for your glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're a guest, welcome indeed to Ridgecrest this morning, and if you did receive a worship folder as you entered, would you just attach that little tab called Next Steps? and give us that information. You can leave that with us in the offering baskets as you exit this morning, or the best option will be come see us in our welcome center. Out that door, look to your left. Down the main hall, we'll be on the right. You can bring that to us. We have a gift bag for you with information about who we are as a church family and how you can get connected with us. And you can also register you, uh, you yourself as a guest by texting that word guest to 334 
384-8080. So just be sure that you can do that, and we'll get that information and get back with you very quickly. Just a reminder of a couple things. We will not have worship this afternoon, but as you heard in RBC 3, next Sunday we'll begin uh, our time together in the evenings at 5 o'clock for Seasons of Prayer. I hope you put that on your calendar. We are looking forward to that as we join each other in that gift of intercessory prayer. And don't forget to go by our Welcome Center this morning and all the activities we have going on for the summer for children and adults. Stop by and see Lance Griffin this morning. He has those information for you. Lance, and with that, Aaron, where are you, brother? You leave us in worship. Right. Let's continue singing and worship this morning. Stand with us as we sing this great hymn. For a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer.
serve a great God, don't we, church? Let's keep singing. Let's sing.
All right, thank you, choir and uh, orchestra, and welcome. So good to have you out on this Easter Sunday morning. It is Easter, you know. Every Sunday is Easter for us because Jesus Christ is risen, and we gather in this place. Well, I am glad you're here, teasing you just a bit there. And, um, you know, this morning I want to do something before I, before I uh, preach, and that is you know, we have uh, lots of birthdays in this church. I've signed uh, birthday cards just about every week. I sign a stack of them, and I really do sign your birthday card when you get it. And so my secretary brings them to me and, and gives them, and then I sign. And, but uh, so uh, we've had lots of them. But every once in a while, there's a special one uh, here or there. And this morning, I want to recognize one of those special ones, and that is... Uh, James Morrison. James Morrison is sitting right over here. James, can you stand? We, can, can you stand up? <laughs> James Morrison will be 98 years old tomorrow. And uh, James, congratulations. I told someone, you can be seated now, James. We love James Morrison. I told someone uh, Wednesday night, I said, if I make it to 98, I hope I'm as sharp as James Morrison. Uh, James Morrison and Mary is where this church, this church started in their home, in their living room. Uh, it's a little different now, isn't it, James? But he's, uh, he's seen a whole bunch. James Morrison's one of my heroes. And I mean that. I remember when uh, I hadn't been here long and we were getting ready. I, I'd led our church in this expansion uh, process and uh, when the uh, the architects and everyone came back and told us exactly how much it was going to cost for us to do it, I have to tell you my knees buckled, and I thought, Lord, I, I what have I gotten these people into? And I, I went to uh, James was on that committee. James was on that committee. Uh, May and Sewell was on that committee, and uh, several others, some who are already in heaven now, but they were on that committee and we were meeting. And I told them, I said, I think we might ought to tackle this project in phases instead of trying to do the whole thing. And I won't ever forget uh, James Morrison said, Pastor, he said, you know, we've always faced challenges here at Ridgecrest over the years and God has brought us through every time. Let's go ahead and just do it all. And I thought, man, this man's seen it all. Uh, who am I to say, no, let's, let, let, let's, let's do it a different way. And so we did, and I'm so grateful for that. And that's one of, just one of many reasons that James Morrison is uh, my hero. And I'm your favorite pastor, aren't I, James? You've seen them all. <laughs> You've been here for all of them, but I'm your favorite. Hold your hand up to let everybody, I'm your favorite, see? Okay. <laughs> well, we love James. Historian Shelby Foote, you may know that name from the many video documentaries that he's made. He tells of a soldier who was wounded at the Battle of Shiloh during the American Civil War. And uh, this soldier being wounded was by his commanding officer instructed to go to the rear of the fight. But the fighting was so fierce that within minutes that soldier who was wounded came back to his commanding officer and he said, Captain, give me a gun. This, this fight ain't got no rear. <laughs> well, you know, that's the way it is sometimes with temptation, isn't it? The battle's everywhere. Front, back, side, you can't get away from it. You're in the fight. You can't get out of the battle. But the fact is, you can fight the battle well, and you can experience victory. And I'm going to give you, at the end of this message, I'm going to give you some biblical, practical things to do when you face temptation. But none of us are exempt. None of us are excused from temptation because the Bible says your adversary, the devil, roams about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, literally destroy. So none of us are exempt. We can't get away from this, this battle with uh, temptation. There was a survey done several years ago, and they asked the people surveyed, what are the top temptations that you're facing? And uh, to a greater or lesser degree, here were their answers. Worrying or being anxious, 60%. These are their answers. 60% procrastinating or putting things off. 
Eating too much, 55% of them said. You can obviously do the math and see that some of them were battling with several temptations. Spending too much time on media, 44%. Being lazy, 41%. Spending more money than they could afford, 35%. Gossiping about others, 26%. Being jealous or envious of others, 24%. Viewing pornography or sexually explicit material, 18%. Abusing alcohol or drugs, 11%. And when asked if they tried to do anything specific to counter the temptations that they were facing, 41% of them said yes, but 59% of those answered, no, I don't even try to fight it. When people were asked why they give in to temptation, they gave four reasons as their top. Number one, because uh, I'm not really sure why I give in to temptation. 50% of them said, I I don't know why I give in. Uh, 20% said, I give in to escape or get away from real life. 8% said to feel less pain or loneliness. And 7% said, I give in to temptation in order to satisfy other people's expectations of me. Now, I don't know how that list stacks up, and your list may be like that, or there may be other temptations you battle or other reasons you tend to yield to temptation, but one thing is clear, and I think you would agree with me, all of us face temptation. Would that be accurate? All of us face temptation. And uh, temptation itself is not sin. In fact, Jesus was tempted. We know of the temptation in the wilderness early in his ministry where he went up on the mountain and was tempted directly by the devil. We know the words of Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 where the scripture says, for we do not have a high priest, that's Jesus, who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who, listen, in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. The issue with temptation, you see, is recognizing it and then knowing how to respond to it. And that's the key to being victorious over temptation. And that's part of being a victorious Christian. And that's what I want to talk with you about this morning. If you're physically able to do so, stand with me as we read from God's Word, beginning in chapter 1 of the book of James, uh, beginning in verse 13. Follow along with me. James writes and says, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. And then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Now, Father, would you speak to our hearts this morning? This is a battle we all face. It is a a part of the war, the spiritual war, and our adversary, we do know, roams about seeking whom he can devour, whom he can destroy. Father, would you teach us today from your word? Would Would you give us truth and principles that will help us as we fight the good fight of faith that we might be victorious over temptation. Now, Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. Now, I want you to do something, if you will, with your Bibles open. I didn't read this verse, but now I want to point you back to a verse, and you'll understand in just a second. Look at verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. James is writing here to believers who had confused something. They had confused trials and temptations. They had confused the testings of God with the temptations of of the devil. And so as a result, assuming that both of those were from God, they were blaming God for their spiritual failures. In other words, if temptation comes from God, if trials come from God, and if I, if I fail in either of those, it's God's fault because God brought them to, and they were blaming uh, God for this. You know, the blame game isn't a new, uh, uh, isn't a new thing. 
You go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, and you remember when uh, Adam and Eve fell, and when God spoke to Adam, the first thing he did was blame Eve. Men have been blaming their wives ever since. Well, she did it. She gave me the fruit, and I did eat. And by the way, it was interesting how Adam said it. He said, the woman that you gave me. You get it? It was her fault, but really, God, it's your fault. Uh, and uh, so he, he blamed. And then uh, Eve turned around. You remember who she blamed? She said, it's the serpent's fault. It's the, we, we've been playing this blame game since the very beginning. And uh, consequently, uh, James is dealing with this issue. It's not God's fault. And he says this. He says, when you're tempted, let no man say he's tempted of God because God cannot be tempted with evil, nor does he tempt any person. Temptation's not from God. Trials are uh, sometimes from God. Trials are part of living in a broken world too. But listen to this. The two words, the one for trials or test and the one for temptation are two completely different Greek words. That's how we know that they're not the same, uh, that, that James is not talking about the same thing. There are some, I grew up and maybe you did too, uh, and I heard at times when I was young, well, you know, God is just tempting us. God doesn't tempt it wasn't until later as I understood the Scripture and began to study the Scriptures that I realized that temptation is not from God. But there are a lot of people today that believe both trials and temptations are from God. Nothing could be further from the truth. And so James is trying to clarify for these uh, that he's writing to that there is a difference between the two. God is never going to try to tempt you to sin. Now think about that, class. God will never try to tempt you to blow it. He'll never tempt you to do the wrong thing. Now, the devil, when God's whispering, do the right thing, the devil, you can bet, will fire up his guns and say, no, do the wrong thing. That's the war. That's the spiritual battle that we have to be mindful of. And so what I want to do this morning is I want us to look at the process, and then, as I said, I want to conclude the message by giving you some biblical responses that will help you have victory over temptation. Here's the first thing I want you to see this morning, found in verse 14. When he is lured and enticed by his own desire, James said, this is where temptation begins. Think about temptation's origination. Temptation's origination. Temptation's first stage could be summed up this way, the enticement stage. It is the enticement stage. It's when the curiosity begins to subtly soften your resistance. Now go back to the garden again. Keep that story in mind. Go back to the garden and remember that the devil appealed to Adam and Eve's flesh and he did that by insinuating that God was holding out on them. God doesn't want you to eat of that tree because God knows if you eat of that tree, you'll be like him. There is this enticement. There is this lure. He dangles, no pun intended, the fruit of more in front of them. God doesn't want you to have the very best. The devil always tells you with temptation that if you'll, if you'll fall to this, this will be good for you. And God doesn't want you to experience something that's good for you. And so he paints this picture that God was depriving them, and he appealed to their flesh. He appealed to their eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, as the Scripture says. They could have more. He lure, he was, he's luring them. Don't you want that? He's creating the curiosity. Now, nothing has changed. Here we are all these years later, these centuries, millennia later, and the devil still appeals to your pride, doesn't he? He still appeals to your flesh, and, and he still appears to uh, your cravings to have more, to be more, and to know more. In his book, The Me I Want to Be, Pastor John Ortberg writes about a story of his wife and himself on their first ever fly fishing uh, event. And he said, we had a guy, and our guide told us that to catch fish, you have to think like a fish. They said that to a fish, life is simply about maximum gratification, the gratification of appetite with the minimum expenditure of energy. To a fish, he writes, life is see a fly, want a fly, eat a fly. A rainbow trout, he writes, never really reflects on where his life is headed. And a girl carp 
rarely says to a boy carp, <laughs> I don't feel that you're as committed to our relationship as I am. Or I wonder, do you love me or do you just care about me for my body? He says, the fish are just a collection of appetites. A fish is a stomach, a mouth, and a pair of eyes. And he said, while we were on the water, I was struck by how dumb fish really are. Hey, swallow this. It's not the real thing. It's just a lure. Uh, you'll think it will feed you, but it won't. It'll trap you. If you were to look closely, uh, fish you would see the hook. And you'd know, uh, once you were hooked, that it's just a matter of time before the enemy reels you in. And then he adds, he says, you'd think that fish would wisen up and notice the hook or see the line. You'd think fish would look around at all their fish friends who go for a lure and fly off into space and never return. But they don't learn. Isn't it ironic that we say fish swim together in schools, but they never learn? And then he closes by saying, aren't you glad we're smarter than fish? James's whole point is that we're a lot like fish. In fact, the, the analogy that James uses there when he says when a person is enticed or when he is lured is actually a fishing analogy that he is using to teach us about the, uh, the, how temptation originates. You see, the devil uses your desires to trick you, to create curiosity, and to fool you into living in the moment and then swallowing his lie and being hooked. And that leads to number two, the second thing I want you to see. And that is, I want you to notice temptation's operation. Now, that was its origination. This is its operation. And he talks, James talks about that in verse 15. Look at verse 15. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. The, the, the second stage is the conception stage. This is the operation. Desire, uh, when it is in th this enticement, leads to this desire. And then it finally conceives. It gives uh, birth. Uh, the conception stage, it takes us beyond just the curiosity and the desire. It takes us to the deed or to the action. And the picture he uses here, different from in verse 14, this is the picture of childbirth. When a person actually begins to look at and to think about the forbidden thing and, and desire and lust are conceived in his mind and then his heart, the picture is that the pleasure of the desire and the sin are actually birthed into an action. Jerry Bridges, who formerly headed up uh, the Navigator's ministry, writes and says this, Our minds are mental greenhouses where unlawful thoughts, once planted, are nurtured and watered before being transplanted into the real world of unlawful actions. And these actions, he writes, are savored in the mind long before they are enjoyed in reality. The thought life, then, is our first line of defense in the battle of self-control. You see, temptation's operation is to move you from thought to action. The devil downplays the consequences and he always makes the outcome look extremely satisfying. Again, it was his tactic in the garden and has continued to be so. I read about a woman who went viral last year. You know what that is. And they post a video and the video gets so popular that it's just everybody's watching it and millions upon millions of people are watching it. And her video went viral on TikTok. She shared this uh, video moment where she unknowingly held one of the sea's most dangerous animals in the palm of her hand. She was studying abroad in Bali, and the clip starts with a shot of her on the beach with a highly venomous uh, cephalopod. And she's holding it in her palm. Um, and a screenshot describes the animal as 
carrying enough venom to kill 26 adult humans within minutes. Uh, The bites are tiny and they're imperceptible and people that are bitten by these venomous creatures rarely know it until respiratory depression and paralysis begins to set in. Now, under that description, she posts cheers for still being alive because, you see, she only learned what she was holding after she posted the picture of this beautiful small sea creature she was holding, and then people started responding back, do you understand what you were holding? She didn't know. It looked beautiful. It was a beautiful creature, and it looked, uh, 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 it looked safe. That's, that's the devil's temptation operation. It looks safe. It, looked like, it looks like it can't do you any harm. It, it looks like everything will be okay. Look, I'm just, I got this. I'm under control. Temptation leads to action that causes you to think that you're under control or you're still in control of what's going on. And listen, friend, you're not. It's like that dangerous cephalopod that you're holding in your hand and the bite is imperceptible at first until it finally begins to shut you down and destroy you spiritually. And that leads to the third thing that I want you to see this morning, and that is I want you to notice temptation's occupation. We see that as well in verse 15. He says, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Now, this third stage, you could simply say, is the death stage. The first is the enticement stage. Uh, uh, the, the, the second stage is the stage where, where conception takes place. But this third stage is where the conception eventually takes you. If you continue to give in and yield to temptation, it will, it will eventually bring forth death, James says. It's when yielding to temptation becomes dominant in your life. It, 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 it occupies major ground. It holds on to you. This is what he's talking about. And, and listen, it, it will destroy you spiritually. It can destroy you physically, too, in, in some cases. But in particular, I believe he's talking about the spiritual collapse that it brings with it as you constantly yield to it. It controls and undermines the spiritual life. I think about a statement that Paul made in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 6. He says, but she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Isn't that an interesting statement? Dead even. That's what sin uh, does. That's what temptation does. This is when the consequences of yielding to temptation take over and they ruin you. They destroy you. And again, as I said, sometimes uh, physically bring death. In the Australian bush country, there's a little plant that grows called the sundew. And the sundew has a a slender stem and uh, tiny round leaves uh, uh, that are fringed with little uh, hairs. And those hairs on these uh, leaves, they're beautiful colored leaves, they glisten with moisture on them. But it's not moisture. It's a sticky substance. And any bug that goes and lands on this beautiful plant will get caught in that sticky substance, and it can't free itself. And as it tries to free itself, it activates through its vibrations that that, uh, 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 plant, that flower, and the the blooms will close in on top of that uh, insect, uh, obviously leading to its death. Well, temptation and sin can look beautiful. And the devil will convince you that it's beautiful. You know, we're told oftentimes, the Bible says, first of all, that the devil masquerades as an angel of light. And we are, uh, from descriptive passages in the Old Testament, there are some who argue, and I think rightfully so, that the devil was probably the most beautiful of all the creations that God made. And so the devil doesn't appear with, when he appears or uh, uh, when he uh, brings his temptation to you. He, he's not going to present an ugly picture to you because he's pretty smart. Paul talked about his schemes, and so he's going to bring something appealing to you, something maybe that looks beautiful to you and cause you to say, now that, that ha- has to be good. It's just too beautiful. That's what those bugs think when they land on that plant before that plant closes in and destroys them. And that's what temptation does. It may look beautiful in the moment, 
but it's deadly to your walk with God. Don't play around with it. Uh, Don't believe that it's harmless and that you have everything under control. No matter how it appears, temptation responded to is a killer. And that leads to the last thing that I want to share with you this morning, and that is I want to show you temptation's obliteration. How, how, do, we, how do we deal with it? And um, uh, so what is our defense when temptation comes? Because the Bible gives us a lot of insight. I'm just going to give you some, but there's much more that the Bible gives us. So how do we, how do we destroy? How do we, how do we defend ourselves when temptation comes? There was a survey of people that noted that temptation were more potent when two things were true in their life. It was more potent, temptation was, when they had neglected their time with God. 81% of the people surveyed said, when I have neglected my time with God, temptation is more powerful in my life. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? Because the Word of God is like a shield for us. The second was when they were physically tired. Physically tired. 57% said, I'm more vulnerable uh, to temptation when I am tired. On the other hand, when it came to resisting temptation, people said that they more easily resisted, uh, resisted temptation by 84% said prayer. 76% said by avoiding compromising situations. 66% said Bible study. And 52% said by being accountable to someone. I think that's pretty good. So how do, how do we, what does the Scripture counsel us? How are we to, to deal with temptation? How do we face uh, temptation? And, and I want to give, uh, give you five things that I think will help you uh, in the battle against temptation. The first we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man, and God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So number one, how do you face temptation? Based on that scripture, listen, rejoice. Does that sound a little strange? Rejoice? You say, Pastor, how would you get rejoice out of that passage? Why should I rejoice? Why in the world would I rejoice when I face temptation? Well, listen to me very carefully. You do not rejoice in the temptation. I'm not telling you to go, "Ah, I'm being tempted. This is exciting. (laughs) Um, There's a word for that, and it's called uh, uh, dumb. (laughs) What do you rejoice in? Does anybody know what you rejoice in? You rejoice that God has made a way of escape. You see, so you can say, here's the temptation. I'm not excited about the temptation, but you know what the good news is? The good news is that if the devil's tempting me, there's a way out. Because God has told me that in his word, that he has provided one. He didn't say, listen to me, he didn't say, now, occasionally I'm going to provide a route of escape for you. Or uh, uh, this way of escape uh, sometimes comes and sometimes doesn't. No, he's, it's all inclusive. When you're tempted, God has a way out. And by the way, I maintain this. If you're serious about finding God's way out, God will make it known to you. A lot of times we already know the way out. We already know how. But God will make it known to you. This isn't a cosmic guessing game either. God's not trying to say, I have a way out. I hope you find it. Uh, back, I don't know, I'd have to ask my family for sure, but just a few years ago, we were up visiting the kids for a birthday celebration in Nashville. It wasn't one of the boys. The boys, in fact, hadn't even been born at that time, so I know it's at least three years or so ago. And they had these things that have become popular across the nation. They're called escape rooms. Do y'all know what I'm talking about, these escape rooms? And what they do is it's a puzzle, really, and you do it with a group generally. You can do it individually. You have these clues, and you follow these clues. They put you in a room, and you have so much time to, to figure out how to get out. There is a way out, but you've got to figure it out. The goal is to complete the whole of course, you've got uh, like an hour, I think it is, to, to get through the whole course, and you go through these various rooms. And uh, so our family thought it'd be fun to do that, uh, and so we all went there uh, together, and uh, then our family, uh, my son-in-law in particular, thought we ought to do the hardest one. 
And so we did, and we began this process. And you got a clock in each room that's counting you down, so you know where you are in the big picture, how many rooms you've got to get through, and all the different clues you have to follow. And um, long and short of it is that uh, we followed the clues, and we got out with 15 seconds to go. We we completed the whole thing, and. And uh, we're pretty proud of ourselves. I'll be honest. We're pretty proud of them. And I told them if it hadn't been for me, they'd have never done it. Uh, that is not true. But, uh, but at any rate, we, we did it. But you know what? It was fun. It was exhilarating. But there was no real consequence if we didn't do it. Because we did it, they gave us these T-shirts that said, I escaped. You know? And then they added $10 for each shirt. <laughs> you know, listen, God doesn't do that with us. Thank, thank the Lord that he doesn't do that. He doesn't say, you're being tempted. There are a bunch of clues. you got to figure the clues out. you got so much time or it's going to be catastrophic for you. You're going to yield and you're going to blow it. Listen, here's what Paul is saying. When temptation comes, if you're serious... God has provided a way out, and you will be able to find that way out. You won't have to go through some cosmic uh, escape room to get out. And so you can rejoice. And maybe the first thing that you do, really, is when temptation comes, instead of saying, Lord, I don't rejoice in this, but I rejoice in you because I know there's a way of escape. And so, God, you make sure that I follow your path. The second thing you can do is found in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 22, where Paul writes and says, So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. The second thing, the first is rejoice. The second is, listen, run. Uh, I don't mean to insult your intelligence, but a lot of people yield temptation because they just don't, they don't run away. Or they just believe it won't affect me. Um, it's like an alcoholic who's been, been clean who decides, I'm, I'm not drinking, but I want to go to the liquor store and just see what the latest uh, liquors are being offered. How dumb. Run. Go the other way. That's what Paul says. And listen, it's not running, just running from something. It's running to something. Go and read that when you have time. Again, meditate on it, 2 Timothy 2. Flee from these passions and pursue righteousness. So he says, run from something, run to something. Pursue the Lord. Charles Spurgeon once said this, What settings are you in when you fall? Know what they are, and then he adds, avoid them. What props do you have that support your sin? You know, the things that keep it in front of you. He says, eliminate them. What people are you usually with when you yield? Avoid them. In other words, you see what he's saying? You, you're smart people. That's what he's saying. Know what the environment is. What, what environment are you susceptible to yield in? What, are there any props or are there any things in your life that, that uh, can produce that sort of thing? Then get rid of them. Are there any people that when you're with those people, you yield to temptation that you know you shouldn't? He says, avoid those people. That's the process of running. And listen, if you can get away, get away. Uh, that's the, the bottom. Never believe that you can handle it, especially when you can run. Getting away from the temptation is oftentimes the way of escape that God made. The door that he opened to, to get away, you say, well, that could hurt some people's feelings. I want to tell you something. It hurts God's feelings when you yield. We need to stop worrying about, am I going to hurt their feelings because I don't hang around with their sin? Or if I don't give in to it? Listen, run. Run as fast as you can. And then there's a third thing that we can do that James tells us about in his book, uh, a few chapters over, chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Listen, he says, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, 
and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your heart, you double-minded. I bet you can already figure out what the third thing is. Can you? The first is rejoice. The second is run. The third is resist. Now listen, if you can't run, and run, you could argue, is a form of resistance, but if you can't run, he says resist, but he tells you even how to resist. So you can't get out of a a, a tempting situation. What do you do? How do you resist? He tells you how to resist. Did you see it in the passage? Did you see it in the passage? He said, submit to God. So turn your eyes, put your eyes on Jesus, put your eyes on God. Listen, I want to tell you something. If you're in a, a, a place where you're going to uh, yield or temp, be tempted to, to yield and you can't run, why don't you just drop your head and start praying? Why don't you just start talking to Jesus? I'm going to submit to you, God. I, I'm, I, I'm going to draw near to you. And look, James says, draw near to him and he will draw near to you. Ed Cole wrote and said, your ability to resist temptation is directly proportionate to your submission to God. So to the degree I'm willing to submit to God, that's the degree to which I'll experience his deliverance and power. So if I submit to him, then I can resist the devil. And listen, the devil doesn't like to be around where God is. So Submit to God. He says, resist. But you don't resist in your strength. You don't resist in your power. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord God Almighty. You can't run away. If you can't run away, submit to God. Resist, resist in the power of the Holy Spirit. Then fourth, Colossians 3, 2 and 3. Paul writes and says, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Here's the fourth thing to do, and that is to redirect. Rick Warren said, temptation always starts in your mind, not in your circumstances. And the fact is, your mind is the biggest battlefield that you will ever fight on. And that's why it must be under the control of Christ. By the way, you say, well, I'd like to have the mind of Christ. When you got saved, you got the mind of Christ. You received the access to the mind of Christ. You know that Paul says we have the mind of Christ. But we're constantly having to renew our mind. This is the greatest battlefield you'll ever fight on is your mind. And that's why he says, so set your minds on things that are above, not on the things on the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ. Put your mind on the things of God. I want to tell you something, it will work. I promise you it will work. If you start focusing on the things of God, if you start setting your mind on the kingdom of God uh, and, and your relationship with Christ, you will be amazed at the power you have to resist the temptations of your enemy. Saintly Amy Carmichael, the great missionary, said, listen to this, all the great temptations appear first in the region of the mind and can be fought and conquered there. And by the way, that goes back to the very first point that I was talking about where James said the enticement stage. That's all mental stuff. And she adds, we have been given the power to close the door of the mind. We can lose this power through dis- disuse or, in- or increase it by use. By the daily discipline of the inner man in things which seem small and by reliance upon the word of the spirit of truth, it is God that works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It is as though he has said to us, learn to live in uh, my will and not by your feelings. That's why Paul writes in Romans 12, "Be, be not conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewal of your mind. Listen, this is where the battle begins. This is the hardest battle. But if you win here, you, you'll, uh, you'll win. And the way you win here is that you, your mind is submitted and set on the things of God. And your mind ha- is in a state of renewal. Whatever you put in your mind is going to dictate the course you take. Whatever you put in your mind is going to shape what you listen to. And what you listen to is going to eventually give you victory or bring you to defeat. 
And so we have to redirect. And then there's a last thing that I would share with you, and that is, if you want victory over temptation, remember the words of Psalm 119 that says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So here's number five. Remember. Remember the word of God. Remember what God has said. J.C. Ryle said the chief weapon that we ought to use in resisting Satan is the Bible. Three times the great enemy offered temptations to our Lord Jesus, and three times the devil's offer was refused with a text of Scripture as Jesus said, it is written. I want to tell you something. I practiced this many years ago and through my life where I I began many years ago practicing it. I found out that if you'll start just quoting Scripture, the devil can't stand Scripture either. He doesn't like the presence of God, and he doesn't like Scripture. You say, well, does it need to be a Scripture based on the temptation I'm facing? He just hates Scripture. (laughs) Just start quoting John 3, 16, Romans 12, 1 and 2. It doesn't matter. You just start, uh, you start quoting Scripture. He hates Scripture. Remember Scripture. Now, I have discovered that the words of God that I've committed to my heart that I think I don't even remember will surface when I need them the most. That's why, by the way, Scripture memorization is important. Because you'll hide things in your heart, and you'll think, ah, I lost that. I, I forgot that. Uh, until the moment occurs and suddenly that scripture will will come forth and you'll say I didn't I, wow that scripture just came why because you hit it down there you did you thought you had lost it but the spirit of God who is the author of the word brings it back in the time when you need it that's why I stay in the word that's why I read the Bible I hope you're reading through the Bible this year remember that's that's what we began in January, reading through the Bible. Now, some of, you, some of you are tempted to stop because you're so far behind. Now, listen, it doesn't matter where you are. Just keep reading. And I want to tell you a little secret. If it takes you two years to read through the Bible, we're not going to kick you out of the church. Are y'all with me? Do you understand? Just keep going. Keep going. Every day, spending time reading God's Word, it'll protect you. It'll build a barrier. The Bible is your sword. It's the, if you go and look at the armor of God in Ephesians 6, you know there's only one offensive weapon in, in the list of the armor. It is the Scripture. It's the Bible. And uh, so memorize it. Speak it, especially in battles with temptation. Now, The five things that I've just shared with you, and we could add many others, I know, they're not going to remove you from temptation, but they will enable you to experience victory over temptation. I want to close by telling you this. Philip Philip Ryken, theologian and a scholar, said the weaknesses that we see in the people of the Bible are the very weaknesses we ought to recognize in ourselves. He says, for example, like Eve who ate the forbidden fruit, you and I are vulnerable to temptation when we act on our own. Or like Abraham who lied about his wife to save his own neck, you and I are vulnerable to temptation when we are scared. Or David who slept with Bathsheba while his men were off to war, we are vulnerable to temptation when we're idle. Or Elijah, who wanted God to end his life, you and I are vulnerable to temptation when we're exhausted. Or there's Peter, who denied his Lord even after he promised Jesus that he would die for him. You and I, likewise, are vulnerable to temptation when we are overconfident. In other words, he writes, You and I are vulnerable to temptation practically all the time. It's true, isn't it? And until heaven, you're going to battle temptation. Because the enemy, though defeated, he doesn't quit harassing the kingdom of God and the people of God. 
So don't quit. If you've been battling some area, don't quit. Don't stop. There's victory. Keep pursuing the victory. Don't stop fighting. I like what Margaret Thatcher once said. She said, you may have to fight a battle more than once to win it. So don't give up. That's true spiritually as well. You may have to keep fighting a battle that sometimes you think you've already won and then it resurfaces. The devil is smart. He uses plots and schemes. So keep waging the good fight of faith, as Paul called it. Spurgeon said there are two equally damning lies that Satan wants each of us to believe. The first is this. Well, if I give in just once, it won't hurt. He says that's a damnable lie because here's what he knows. If you give in once, there's a good chance you'll find it easier to give in again and then again and then again and then again. So he says it's a, it's a lie, though, that the devil wants us to believe, well, just this time or just one more time or, or that sort of thing. The de- he says it's a, it's a destructive lie. The devil wants us to believe. But the second one he said is what I want to close with. He says, the devil tells us, now that you have ruined your life by giving in to temptation, you are now beyond God's use, and so you might as well keep on sinning and just enjoy the sin because you're beyond a place of help. He says, the devil wants us to believe that. I think he's right. Oh, well, what's the use? I've tried and I fail. I tried and I fail. I can't seem to find victory. I can't seem to win. I'll just give in, and this is who I am, and this is the way I live. Don't you ever, this is war. You keep fighting. You keep fighting. All of us have been amazed at the Ukraine, haven't we? That they've just continued to fight. They've continued to fight. From the get-go, we've been told, and they've been told, you don't stand a chance. But they've continued to fight. Now, spiritually, the devil says, don't you understand that you can't stand against me? And the fact is, you can't. But somebody else did. 2,000 years ago on that cross, Jesus stood against the devil so you could live a life of victory. Your victory isn't in you. It's not in how smart you are. It's not in how how clever you are. It's not in how uh, uh, popular you may be. Your victory doesn't come through those things. Your victory comes in Christ and Christ alone. That's where victory is. And so if you are here today or you're watching by live stream or listening on radio or watching by television and you have about given up, I want to encourage you today, don't quit. Don't give up. Go back. Think about the strategy that is delivered to us in the Word of God. Think about the fact that the devil is already defeated. You know, he's already defeated. At the consummation of the age, he'll uh, receive the consequences of that defeat fully. But you can have the victory that was given to you through the cross and the resurrection. You can have it right now. Keep fighting, keep battling, don't get discouraged, don't believe that if you've given up in so much that there's just no hope for you, get up every day and fight the good fight all over. Would you bow your head, close your eyes, no one's looking about in this place, this is a moment of invitation. And uh, all of us could identify with temptation, there's not a, a soul in this room or listening to me in any way that couldn't identify with temptation. What we may have done is become discouraged at the possibilities of victory. So I want to renew your hope today that in Christ, in Christ alone, there is victory. And if you've never trusted Christ, you need to call on Him. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And the Bible says that as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God. I spoke briefly about the armor of God in the message. Not much, just briefly. But the fact is, Christ has an armor for you to wear so that you can fight the good fight of faith. But you have to have a relationship with Him. It's the armor that comes when you enlist in the kingdom of God. So if you've never done that today, would you? Would you call on Him right now? Would you say in your heart sincerely, Lord Jesus, 
Thank you for dying on the cross to ensure that I could have victory. Lord, I want to walk in the victory that comes in a relationship with you. Teach me to to trust you, but Father, teach me to turn my eyes toward heaven, to set my mind on things above, to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. But I invite you to come and be my Savior. Forgive me of my sins. Give me new life in you. And then for those of you who are so discouraged, be encouraged. God loves you. You're not too far beyond his ability to bring new victory in your life. Fight the good fight. Start all over if you failed. Start all over. Start all over. Keep fighting in him. Let him take you to ultimate victory. Now, Lord Jesus, hear these prayers. Father, help us to be your victorious saints. Help us not to allow the enemy to lie to us and then believe the lies that you're holding out or believe the lies that we cannot win. And Father, in the cross, we've won. And so, Father, I pray for those who are watching, those in this live audience, that we would walk in victory over temptation one day at a time, one day at a time. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me for our time of invitation? I'll be here at the front as I always am, and our staff will be on the sides, and I want to invite you to slip out from your seat. There's maybe one of several decisions for you to make this morning. Maybe you prayed that prayer, calling on Christ, and you want to come, and you want to receive Him as your Savior. Would you slip out from where you're seated? Come, and we'll receive you here and pray with you about that. Maybe you want to come and pray around this altar I hope you'll come and use it, praying for someone, praying about some matter, uh, praying uh, whatever the Lord may impress upon you. Use this altar. Maybe you're here today and you'd like to become a part of our family. You can do that. Your little tear-off panel on the back tells you how you can join or you can indicate a decision and you can tear that off. That's one way to do it. You can bring it to us or you can drop it in the baskets on the way out. We'll get it. We'll take it from there. But maybe today you'd like to become part of this family. We'd love to have you. As we sing, as Brother Aaron and the choir leads us, you slip out. You come on. We're here to receive you right now. Balcony and ground floor, you come on.